Yesterday we talked about the nativity and we described how all of the nativity is found in the patterns of the stars, the sheep and the cows and the three wise men and everything is exactly in the stars. Uh, at least it was at the time of Christ, but not in our times because of the precession of the equinox, but it's still pretty close during our time. And the idea was that we were trying to indicate that the horoscope of Christ, which is what a nativity is, is a cosmic event. It's not a personal event. The horoscope of Jesus is a very different thing. Now, in that rendition of the nativity, there was one glaring omission. And we're going to spend the next this today and tomorrow and a little bit on the day following talking about the glaring omission and that is the uh, subject that there have been millions of words written about and all kinds of theories that you could believe or not believe and that is the uh, Christmas star and so we're going to explore the Christmas star for a few times. There's only one mention of it in the Gospels. And we'll read that. It's a very short section. It's just 12 verses. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king... Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Jesus should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judea, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood where the young child was. And they saw the star and rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All right. Now, it seems rather straightforward, but there's a lot to be questioned. For one, where was the star? Now, I read about, you know, there's a place called uh, Crosswalk on the, um, uh, on, on the internet, and they give you up to 20 different versions of the Bible, different interpretations or different translations of the Bible. And I looked at the 10 that are considered the most important and I could find no common agreement about where the star was. Some interpretations say it arose in the east. Others say they were in the east when they saw the star. But most of them just say uh, they saw a star in the east. Not that the star was in the east or that they were in the east. So... Everything is really ambiguous. Another question about all this is, who were the wise men? As tradition has it, they were Persians. They were magi. They were high initiates. And uh, 
Some traditions even give them names. We've all uh, sung the Christians, uh, the Christmas sto- song, We Three Kings of Orient Are, and they have the names of the three of them. But those names are found nowhere in the Bible, which is supposedly the uh, reference. And uh, so there's no scriptural uh, basis for the names of the wise men or even where they are from other than from the east. Now, St. Matthew's Gospel, it was written about 47 years after the crucifixion. And the earliest copy that we have of it is from 300 years later. We talked a little bit about all the Gospels in that way last, last night. So, there was an oral folklore tradition and that may contain those names and where they were from, but there's nothing in the Bible to indicate that. But what is most questionable is where the behavior of the star, what it was and where it was. You know, stars except if you're uh, navigating by them and they're standing in one place, uh, they normally don't move around. You know, it's not like a star is out there with a lantern uh, guiding the way for you so that you can see. And it isn't a star that blinks like a neon light that says, this is the place. <laughs> and it's kind of hard to find a navigation that would bring them to a little tiny town in uh, Israel. So we don't know, actually, these things. Now, we're going to try to answer and see what the star was, and it's going to be a long Siege. Three day, three three interpretations today, and two tomorrow, and one on uh, Thursday. Now, first of all, we have to reiterate what was re, which was spoken last evening, and that the stars, uh, that the gospels, are myths for the mysteries. They are not histories, even though they contain historical information in them. They are mystery myths. They are not biographies, because if they wanted to write a biography, they could have written a very good biography, but they are not. They are myths that are used for four different types of people to come to initiation. So, since they are mystery myths, And the mysteries are based on the scheme of the evolutionary creation. The uh, structure of the cosmos is integral to the mystery myths. So, the whole principle of, or the whole structure of the evolutionary creation is based on a very few simple principles used and reused analogously. So that the things that happen on one plane of existence or in one world are analogously in others. Something that we all knew since childhood when we dis- when we looked at a picture of an atom in our science books and we said, wow, an atom looks like a solar system. They're analogous. We didn't know the word analogous, but we saw that. So they're all based on the principle of the hermetic axiom, as above, so below. What has gone before in heaven will follow after on earth. Know this and rejoice. But we are such materialistic creatures, and we are creatures of uh, being possessed by our senses rather than our senses helping the spirit. We're all tied up in attachment to sensory information. And with all of the levels of analogy, it's possible to get lost in the complications. So that unless an individual has a really good 
intuition and a knowledge of the fact that there is the principle of analogy, you can uh, get lost in it all. And this happens every now and then. Somebody studies the Bible, usually the book of Revelation, and they look for conditions and they see a pattern and they say, wow, this pattern is just like what is described in the book of Revelation and this must mean that this is the end times. And so they uh, usually start some kind of end times uh, cult or we're, we're going to be ready for when we're all taken and into the inner worlds. And the time comes and it doesn't happen. And then they become laughing stocks and then they say, oh, we just miscalculated. Now what they have done is not wrong because patterns on analogous levels of magnitude occur and reoccur and reoccur again. And unless you have the intuition to know what, you know, whether this is a small cycle that when it ends is also the end of a large cycle so that there's a major change in the evolutionary creation, you're going to get lost in this and you're going to get carried away. And that's what happens. So, there are all kinds of interpretations to the star. And when we're dealing with spiritual truth, there is not just one answer. It's like when you're when you're compacting and a moment in evolution and a formula for initiation into something as small as the gospel, there's going to be a lot of uh, different things that are compacted into a very small uh, space or a very small expatiation. And so there are many different sides to the truth. And I'm going to present different views of what the star was. And some of them are utterly fantastic and absurd. Others have equal value as far as being considered what the star represents. Let's first look at, uh, here comes everybody now. <laughs> John Hempstead is coming down to visit. Jorge? John Hempstead will be down here at noon tomorrow to visit with you. Oh, spectacular. Yeah. Yes. Good news. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Eddie? Eddie? Ed, Bobby Stevens is in the hospital. He had four aneurysms in his throat, and they're bringing him, for, bringing him out of uh, coma today. So prayers are called for. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's look first at a fantastic one, which I'm willing to believe may be an interpretation of the star, but. It is with great generosity that uh, I am thinking that way. According to this view, the Magi are either hybrids or outright ETs, extraterrestrials. And their wisdom that is described in the Gospels is actually advanced technology. We know these types of people. We run into them all the time. The stars that are in the sky are not in the spiritual heavens, but they're in the sensible heavens that we see with our eyes every day. And the Christmas star to them is the mothership. And the mothership <laughs> is leading them to where the most advanced of the ETs is to become manifest on the earth. And they have their interpretations of the gifts, uh, which we, we gave our own last night. And this is what many people believe the star is. I have a friend who for years belonged to a UFO cult. 
And all of us were wringing our hands and saying, oh my God, he's going to go off the deep end and uh, he's going to get carried away and we're never going to see him again. But by carried away, I don't mean by a, by a starship. <laughs> but he went into it with a very open mind and he came out the other end just as pure as when he went in and he knew about all those phenomena after that. And he was really open-minded about it and still is to this day. So, there, there are a lot of people that follow this kind of view. I am open. I have no idea of what UFOs are. I have many friends that have seen them. And I've heard all kinds of interpretations. And I've read books about them. But I can't follow the philosophy. It's a techie kind of philosophy. It's, there's no spiritual wisdom in it. It's, it's all high tech. And the whole view of it is it's passive. The teaching is given by the cosmic brotherhood and you just take it in. There's no emphasis on character development. There's no emphasis on spiritual becoming. And uh, there's especially no emphasis on self-reliance. It's sort of like the Space Brothers are in control and they're going to take over. All right. That view of what the Christmas star was is not really um, to my liking. So let's look at a different interpretation. This is one of the many interpretations that I think are simultaneously true. And it won't be until tomorrow or Thursday that we get to what the real interpretation is from Christian mysticism. This is a processional interpretation. The earth seen physically is a big rock that has a molten core and it's been flung out to or spontaneously developed in space. And even though to us it is a huge heavy object, because it is floating in space, it's very sensitive. I had an experience once where in a uh, national park, I was in a lake way back in the woods, and there were still big logs there from the time when there had been logging. And you could swim up to a log, and you could move it with your fingers, because it was floating in the water and there wasn't the drag of friction. And it's like that with the uh, earth. The earth is sort of wiggling and wobbling in space. And the wiggles are called nutations. And the wobbles are called processionary wobbles. But the wobble, wobble is very slow. One wobble takes... Uh, 25,868 years, more or less. And the wobbles are opposite the direction of the orbital revolution and the axial rotation. So we're moving one way through space and we're spinning in the same way, but the wobble is backwards. And the consequence of that is, I don't want to go into it because it would be too much to describe it, uh, describe it all, and I've done that so many times already. The consequence of it is that the equinoxes, that is where the uh, sun is exactly on the equator, the equinoxes, if you look at the star patterns behind them, the equinoxes gradually work their way through the star patterns on, on the uh, ecliptic so that in 25,868 years, they have worked all the way through the entire zodiac and they come back to the start. That's called precession of the equinoxes. And the equinoctial point is the first degree of Aries. And the first degree of Aries is analogous to the ascendant in the horoscope. And we know that the horoscope is, uh, that the ascendant in the horoscope indicates the dense physical body. And so that whatever is on the ascendant is what the physical body looks like. The physical body for human culture is architecture. 
so that if we look at the architecture in the various processional era, uh, epochs, we see different kinds of architecture. Like, for example, in the age of Taurus, we had Taurus is a very defensive sign, and we had the wall of China and the ziggurats of Babylon, and everything was very heavy, very solid, and very defensive. When the equinox proceeded into Aries, then the architecture became very bold and open, like the Greek temples were all created during the procession of the equinox through Aries. When the equinox proceeded through Pisces, Pisces is a mystical sign and it broods in sort of a fog of emotion and then we have the architecture of the great cathedrals they're dark and mystical and they all have the flying buttresses which are like they're leaning like somebody leans an elbow on the bar which Pisces people are sometimes more prone to do than other people and uh, as we're approaching the Aquarian age it's already becoming manifest Aquarius is ruled by uh, Saturn and Uranus. And when we look at the architecture now, you go right downtown here, you see it in the new buildings. The architecture is concrete, which is uh, calcium minerals that have been recrystallized or partially recrystallized, and they're ruled by Saturn, and glass. Glass, the transparency when things are so clear that they seem indubitable, which is an Iranian quality. So we can see the influences are in our world and in, the, in society right around us, but we don't always uh, notice that. Now, what we want to do is not look just at constellational areas. We want to look at specific stars. And uh, I should have put this on the board earlier. The, when you look at the uh, bull in the zodiac, as it's pictured uh, pictorially, the bull has his head down and he's charging. The ram is not. The ram is lying on its side. The ram is, this is sort of like the body, and this is the head of the ram. And he's got a, uh, this, this over here is the four brightest stars. This is all Bhutan. I don't know if I'm pronouncing or spelling it right, which means the belly. It's in the belly of the ram. The brightest star is in the ram's forehead. It's called al Sharatan. The uh, second brightest is called al Kamel. And out at the tip is Misorium. We have no historical records of when the equinox went over Al-Bhutan. But when it went over the brightest star in Aries, this coincides with probably what is in historical history the brightest stars of human civilization. At the same time, and some of these people did meet each other, Pythagoras supposedly met Buddha. They were contemporaneous. David met one of the Zoroasters, and they were all four contemporaneous. And Kung Fu Si, who we call Confucius, did meet Lao Tzu. And they were all present at the time when the equinoctial point went over the brightest star. A few hundreds of years later, it went <coughs> over El Hamel. And when it went over El Hamel was the glory time of Athens. It is when the period of uh, Plato and Aristotle and the great uh, Greek playwrights and all of those things. What we are interested in when it went over Misorium, which was about the time of the... Uh, incarnation. It's at the tip of the horn and sometimes it is called El Neith. I don't know how to pronounce it. It is another name for the same star. And in uh, 
Hebrew, it is the star of Joshua. And Joshua is the root from which Joshua comes. When it says in the Bible that Joshua blew on the ram's horns and the walls came down. It's talking about this star. Joshua is also the root from which the name Jesus comes. So it's not surprising that uh, Missorium should be the star uh, that is associated with Jesus and according to the procession of the equinox it works out all very nicely. So I think there is a whole school of people that believes that this is what is, you know, if you go forward in the zodiac, it's in the in astronomical, astrological lingo going forward in the zodiac is going west. Going backward in the zodiac, like the processional cycle, is going east. And the eastmost point is, uh, where the cusp between, uh, uh, Aries and Pisces is. And so, when the star is in the east, El Hamel is very close. Uh, there, you know, there isn't any uh, demarcation like these nice clean demarcations that we have on, in the diagram. It was very close to the time of the beginning of the age of Pisces. And so, uh, to say that Missorium was the uh, star of Jesus, I think is valid. But as we said earlier, the truth has many sides to it. And uh, now let's look at it. This, this, is, this is a day of talks that is not deeply spiritual. It is dealing with all kinds of technical things. Uh, they're fascinating, and I think it's important that we know them because they affect us and they affect our history. Now let's turn to another interpretation of what the star is and that has to do with what are called great conjunctions. Great conjunctions are between the two big planets or the two heavy planets. That is the conjunctions of Saturn and Jupiter. And they are said to be great conjunctions. Now, the conjunctions of Saturn and Jupiter are, in terms of the history of astronomy, astrology, are some of the most studied of all things. I don't know about uh, whether they have done much with the great conjunctions in India, but most of the earliest things that we know about them come from Persia. Again, where the wise men come from. Of course, the rest of the world knew about great conjunctions also. Like in the Aztec calendar, uh, their calendar had a terminal date. Much like the people talked about the Mayan calendar, the Aztec calendar had a terminal date, and that was the, that their, their calendar went no further. And that terminal date was on a conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. But the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, in some cases, because of the, you know, because of the gravitational effects, the, uh, uh, eccentricity of the orbits changes so that sometimes they're closer to circular and sometimes they're more elongated. And uh, so they last uh, more or less long. And this happened to be an exceedingly long within orb conjunction between Saturn and Jupiter. And under this conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter is when Cortez came in and eliminated the Aztec society. So they had just reason for not taking their calendar any further. So this, these are things that have been known all over the world. Now, let's see. Um, we're going to look at something different in order to get at this. The great astronomer Johannes Kepler uh, was teaching a mathematics class. And in that mathematics class, he uh, drew a circle and he taught geometrically how to inscribe an equilateral triangle inside of the circle. And uh, then he taught geometrically how to inscribe 
a circle inside the equilateral triangle. He's teaching like kids that are young high school kids, kids, and he's looking at this and he has a eureka. And he says the relationship of this circle to this circle is almost identical to the circle, to the relationship of the orbits of Jupiter to Saturn. And this set him off for the rest of his life, uh, thinking about the relationship between geometric figures and planetary orbits. And he built big armillary spheres where he had, uh, different, uh, Pythagorean or uh, Platonic solids built right inside the, uh, right inside the the spheres and he was trying to develop the show that the Pythagorean mathematics as it related to music also related to the orbits of the planets and he spent the rest of his life doing that and incidentally along the way he came up with three laws of motion that indicated the truth of uh, a, a heliocentric astrology it was equal areas and equal time uh, the the orbits are uh, the orbits of all the planets is our ellipses and I forget what the third one is it had something to do with distance and Pythagorean proportions but this laid the basis for Isaac Newton and uh, his celestial mechanics with the calculus. So Kepler was one of the earliest people to say that the Christmas star must have been a conjunction between Saturn and Jupiter. And he wrote about it to that length. And uh, ever since then, Astronomers and astrologers have been looking at that. A uh, very famous living astrologer makes a big deal about it, but he doesn't. He hasn't gone really deeply into it enough to uh, to say anything. Now, the uh, conjunction between Saturn and Jupiter occurred either at around six or seven B.C., and uh, that's close enough because. The zero AD is there's there's no there's no historical basis for that being the the birth of Christ. That is something that was arbitrarily set down by the Catholic Church because they uh, wanted some consistency, and they wanted uh, you know something that could be relied upon. Because in the early church there were all kinds of uh, Christian ideas. And they had to have these councils in order to decide what is Christianity going to be? What is the official brand? And uh, one of the things that was uh, done was to name the beginning of what is called the Christian era. Now, the funny thing about it is that, well, we talked about it last night. We said that Christianity swallowed all of the ancient mysteries alive. And it Christified them. It universalized them. And in doing this, it introduced a new religion. The religion of the second person of the Trinity. That is the Son. Represented by a being we know as Christ, who is the focus of the life spirit. And... Uh, this is something that transcends all the differences. It is something of complete unity and complete novelty. And for this reason, all of the old mysteries were made into something new. And so what we're looking at here is the in the horoscope of Christ, which is not the horoscope of Jesus, we're looking at the birth of a whole new epoch. You would expect that that would happen at a uh, at an important time. Now, the uh, conjunction at six or seven BC between Saturn and Jupiter was not an occultation. They were in the same degree, but they were not in the same declination. They were actually one degree apart in declination, which means that two full moons could pass between the two of them uh, without touching either of them. Because the, when you look at the moon in the sky, it's about one half a degree. So, it wasn't a an occultation. But that isn't what's really important about that. 
there is going to be an occultation of Saturn and Jupiter where Jupiter covers up Saturn that you wouldn't even know it was there unless you had been following it. But that won't occur until the year 7541, which is a pretty interesting time because that is the time when uh, Nostradamus says that there will be the destruction of the Earth. And it will be about the time that the equinoctial points gets to the southern gates, that is, between Sagittarius and Capricorn. And the northern and southern gates are when all major changes occur in terms of the Earth. Like the last flood, there were three different floods. Uh, the last flood of Atlantis occurred when uh, the equinoctial point was at the northern gates between Gemini and Cancer. And so that the year 7,541 sounds like a reasonably good time. But uh, <laughs> uh, I don't want to get a whole lot into that. The, uh, this disagrees pretty much with Max Seindel because Max Seindel uh, claims, according if you take the calculations from Max Seindel, it was at 496 A.D. that the uh, equinoctial point was exactly on the cusp between Aries and Pisces. And this is really interesting because it coincides almost exactly with the Second Nicene Council. And the Second Nicene Council, Nicaea was a little city in Turkey where all the church fathers got together and they decided what was going to be the true Christianity. And everything from before that time was thrown out. All of the wisdom from uh, Plato and Aristotle and Pythagoras and all that was declared heresy. And from then on, it was almost like the blind faith, which was necessary for Christianity to develop under. The blind faith of Pisces was the order of the day at that time. <coughs> all right. Now, the Saturn-Jupiter conjunctions are called great conjunctions. But if you study them more deeply, you can find that there are greater Saturn and Jupiter conjunctions at some one time or another. And this is because of what are called the trigons of Saturn and Jupiter. Suppose we start at the beginning of the zodiac, saying that number one is right at the cusp of Aries. Twenty years later, at three degrees of Sagittarius will be the second conjunction in the cycle. Twenty years later, the next one will be at six degrees of Leo. Twenty years later, it will be at nine degrees of Aries, and then it goes to 12, de 12 degrees of Sagittarius and then it goes to 15 I'm not making a very pretty chart here and it goes oops, wrong way <laughs> but you can see that it produces a network of triangles that works its way through the zodiac every 20 years so like a simple conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, you could call a first degree conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter. goes no further than that. Now, there are approximately, and I say approximately because, we, because of all these things, uh, uh, all the possibilities of celestial mechanics, they, don't, they aren't like clockwork. They aren't perfectly at 20 years and they aren't uh, perfectly at 243 degrees. Uh, but on the average, or approximately, there are 10, uh, 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 10 replications of conjunctions of Saturn and Jupiter within, within one element. We looked at the fire. And after the fire, they go into Earth into, into air and then into water. And since there are 10 replications and there uh, are 20 years apart, 
the conjunctions stay in one element for approximately 200 years. And when it goes through all four elements, it's 800 years. And when it goes through all four elements and comes back to the first one 800 years later, that is a, sec that is a third degree conjunction between Saturn and Jupiter. So there's a simple conjunction is just the, uh, is the first degree. A second degree is when it changes elements, and third degree is when it has passed through all four elements. And according to the degrees, there is a magnitude of importance. Now, let's look at something very fascinating. Uh, it's fascinating because it, you know, this is this is a bells and whistles kind of talk. Nothing really important, but the the the, uh, the it's one of those mind blowing kinds of things. This is what involves the, uh, what is sometimes called the curse of Tippy Canoe, and sometimes it is called the curse of Tecumseh. It should be called the curse of Tenskatwa. But that's a name that's so hard to pronounce that we don't call it that way because he's the pronouncer of the curse. What happened was is that in 1811, William Henry Harrison was the governor of the Indiana Territory. And he was very devious. And he negotiated with the Indians and actually got a lot of land from them. This is something that's true to this day. Real estate lawyers have told me that realty law is more complicated than any other kind of law because it was used to cheat the Indians and they went through all kinds of machinations to do that. But at any rate, uh, the Shawnee Indians were very angry and they decided that they were going to put an end to... Uh, the uh, westward expansion of the white people. And the chief of the uh, Shawnee Indians was Tecumseh. And his brother was Tenskatwa, who was both a war leader and a prophet, which means he was something like a shaman or something like that. They lost the war, and the, the main battle was called the Battle of Tippecanoe, and uh, Harrison won that, uh, and on the basis of that, he was elected president. And I'm sure we all remember from our history classes the slogan, uh, Tippy Canoe and Tyler too, because Harrison uh, was called the, the, the man of Tippy Canoe. Now, on the top of the board is a uh, listing of the curse of the Kamsa. The curse was that um, Harrison would die and that every uh, that every person who was the leader of the white people would die that was born in the year that was harmonious with Harrison, which means every 20 years. So, these are the conjunctions going back to 1802. Uh, this, this was the first conjunction in earth signs was in 1802, but because of the orbits being so strange, the next one was in the very late degrees of Aries, and then it settled in for real into the earth signs. And so, Harrison died on, uh, after being elected under a conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, we know Abraham Lincoln died, Garfield died, McKinley died. They all died on their, after being elected. Kennedy was the last one in the cycle. The first conjunction in the air signs was when Ronald Reagan was elected president. Now, there was a threat on his life, but he lived. And that broke the cycle so that when the last... Uh, when the last uh, conjunction in Earth came, it was George W. Bush. And there was a threat on his life, but it's very fitting that all the potency of the cycle was taken out because 
they threw a grenade at him in, in Iraq, and the grenade was a dud. <laughs> so all the potency was taken out of the whole business. This Now, this is really, for, for people who are astrology mavens, this settles a very big argument, but there's a big controversy about what is the horoscope of the United States. Uh, one of the horoscopes of the United States has Gemini rising. And that's the one I have favored. But the modern technical astrologers, with all of their different kinds of uh, rectifications, believe that it was the opposite sign, Sagittarius rising. And they go to great lengths to prove that, and people like me are considered simple fools. But this actually verifies that. Because the first that in earth sign that stayed in the earth sign is in the eighth house of the United States. And everyone, as long as they were in the earth signs, every president died. The eighth house is the house of death. So this clearly indicates that uh, there's something to the idea that the United States has Gemini rising. It also makes the uh, one that's coming up in 2020 uh, very interesting, especially for uh, Rosicrucian students, because the one in 2020 is one that's going to set into the air signs, and it's going to be in the ninth house. And in the ninth house is the house of religion, and uh, this is the time, Eddie, you've heard those uh, rumors that somewhere in 2020 or around 2026 is what they claim, is that the person who was uh, Maine's and Parsifal will be reborn to, and the Max Heindel said he hoped they would be reborn through the Rosicrucian Fellowship and that would bring a new impulse to Christianity and would break down all this earthy materialism that we've been going through. So it's a significant time. And I might even be alive at that time yet. Maybe not, but, uh, uh, it, you know, this is all frou-frou. It's all fluff. Now, you can take these cycles and uh, you, you can take the 20 year, the 200 year, and the 800 year and you can tie them together with the processional cycle so that when it enters into a new element and it enters into a new element and the first conjunction happens right at the beginning of Aries, that's something that happens once every 28,000 years or 25,800 years and with that, this is the kind of conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter that was at 6 or 7 BC. It wasn't exactly at the beginning, but when you take into account uh, the uh, precessional view as well as the uh, great cycles of Saturn and Jupiter, a few years here and there is nothing when you're talking about cycles that are thousands or, or millions of years long. So there are four different degrees of Saturn-Jupiter conjunctions. And each one is something of greater magnitude. And as far as we know at this point with human knowledge, or at least that I know about it, the highest degree of significance was the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction that occurred before the Incarnation. So what this indicates then is that there are two uh, physical, these are not spiritual things, these are just physical things, that there are two physical explanations for the star in the Gospels, and uh, they both coincide with each other. They're close enough so that in, ter in astronomical terms that they are meaningful. Now things like this are fascinating and you can be awed by them and you can be suckered in. I'm glad that Kepler got suckered into being fascinated by this kind of thing. But you have to be careful about it because, you know, we have only so much time here. And spiritually, we can get off the path very easily by getting fascinated by something and then we're carried away before we know about it. You can fritter away a lot of time looking at different kinds of cycles. Uh, this should be enough to set our hearts at rest that there is something 
to various views about the star. But as mystical students, we want to uh, look for something more spiritual. We want to go into something more deep than that. And that's what we're going to do tomorrow. And uh, for right now, we'll close for today by saying the Rosicrucian student's prayer. O oh God, increase our love for Thee so that we may serve Thee better from day to day. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in Thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Did that answer your question, Cliff? Yeah, okay. No other questions? Okay, thank you. What?